Hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Um, before we begin and we do some introductions, I would like to let you know that tonight's session is being recorded. And because of that, we are asking that people keep their microphones and their videos off as well, just for some anonymity. And if you're having trouble with that, don't worry. I do go through and make sure uh, that you are off. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you see my eyes flitting around, it's because I'm just making sure I'm admitting everybody so they can enjoy tonight with us. Welcome and thank you for joining the Orange County Historical Museum for an interesting race case of racial justice with our very own curator, Courtney Smith. My name is Tanya Day and I'll be doing a short introduction for her. We do suggest that for best viewing tonight, you choose active speaker view. And again, the session is being recorded. So please be sure that you are muted with your video camera off throughout the duration of the program. We do welcome questions at the end. We may run a little bit long. We'll try to be mindful of your time, but we would love to hear your questions at the end. So feel free to pop them into the chat box at the end of the presentation. Last month, the museum hosted Dr. Warren Miltier Jr., who is a professor of history at UNC Greensboro for a presentation on free blacks of North Carolina. There was so much interest in his talk, which you can see on our YouTube channel, by the way, it was recorded as well. We thought there might be some interest in a case about racial justice that our exhibits and programs coordinator, Courtney Smith, investigated a few years ago. So we've added it to our lineup of programs. Courtney Smith began working for the museum in June of 2020. Since then, she has revitalized the permanent exhibit, created three special exhibits, and provided educational content through tours, presentations, and social media. She has earned a Bachelor's of Arts in American Studies from Hamilton College, an MAT in History from UVA, and studied public history at Shippensburg University. Her first novel, Lies Based on True Stories, is set during the Civil War and told from various perspectives. It received accolades from the prestigious Kirkus Reviews and is available to purchase here at the museum. Courtney, we look forward to hearing about this case. Hi, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and get started and share my screen. Okay, so um, before I begin, I, I need to begin with a disclaimer. Um, and as you um, hopefully saw in the full title of this presentation, the court case that I'm about to discuss um, is not an Orange County court case. It's not Orange County history or North Carolina history, um, but it is Southern history, um, US history, black history for the month of February, and most importantly, it is a fascinating case. The case is fascinating for two main reasons. First, because it's the story of ordinary people who had been enslaved and were trying to persevere through the hardships and challenges of the post-Reconstruction era when everything was stacked up against them. Through their depositions, their voices were documented an extremely rare occurrence in the 1880s. Extraordinary people like Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington had their stories published, but ordinary enslaved people would not have their stories told until the 1930s WPA project. And the second reason it is such an incredible case is, spoiler alert, it actually has a happy ending. And so the case is about a Baptist church. It took place in 1886 in Lewisburg, West Virginia, the capital of Greenbrier County. Today, as you can hopefully see, there's a little delay in the, the slides coming up. Lewisburg is a charming small town very much like Hillsborough, although about half the size of Hillsborough. However, Lewisburg's history wasn't always charming. I'll talk about this subject again, but to set the stage, you should know 
that as late as 1931, there was a lynching in Lewisburg where two black men were brutally murdered and no one was ever punished for the horrific act. Okay, let's begin. I'll start first with the facts that led up to the case. To do that, we need to go back to 1796 when a group of 14 Baptists were officially recognized as the Lewisburg Baptist Church. At that time, they were meeting in a private residence. However, they soon had so many members that they needed a larger meeting place. Unlike other small denominations, which were permitted to hold services at the courthouse in Lewisburg, the Baptists were considered a fringe cult-like group and they were excluded from this privilege. Therefore, in 1832, with a membership of 30, they began erecting their own place of worship. 11 years later, in 1843, their membership had grown to the substantial number of 86, and they could no longer be dismissed as an insignificant sect. Therefore, they requested that the trustees of the town convey a portion of the lot where their meeting house was located for, quote, the use of said church forever. After they completed building a substantial brick church, the town agreed to give them the land forever. The deed for the parcel was recorded in 1855 and again duly acknowledged in 1856. Now throughout the antebellum period, the racial composition of the membership of Lewisburg Baptist Church was mixed. The founding pastor, Reverend Josiah Osborne, insisted upon integration within the congregation. However, he also insisted that there would be no equality in the church and that all people of color would be treated as slaves. I was unable to find any church records that accurately depict the number of black adherents from the church's earliest days through the end of the reconstruction era. Yet, auxiliary documentation and oral tradition confirm that enslaved people regularly attended worship services and considered themselves to be members of the church. Originally, the number of slaves attending the Lewisburg church was small and they were required to sit together on a designated bench in the rear of the building. However, in the 1840s, their numbers were significant enough that a gallery was constructed. And you can see here, that is actually the original slave bench. So um, pretty incredible that the church still has it um, today. And then in the other picture, you can see all of the gallery space that they built to um, uh, accommodate the black members of the church. Now, during the Civil War years, the Lewisburg congregation lost nearly all of its white members. Many left Lewisburg to serve in the Confederacy and never returned. Those who remained in Lewisburg were compelled to forsake church services because all of the public structures in the town were occupied by soldiers, both Union and Confederate, um, and the building was used either as a barracks or hospital. As a result, the church sustained much damage. Windows were smashed out, the roof sagged, doors were broken and had no locks. In the years immediately following the Civil War, the few remaining white members abandoned the Lewisburg church. Most began worshiping in neighboring communities where the congregation was entirely white. Consequently, the newly freed Black Baptists sought permission from the former white members to continue to worship in the abandoned building. These Black adherents established a vibrant and flourishing congregation. By 1884, the church had 31 members. Without any supervision or assistance, they restored the damaged church building by installing windows in the empty openings, 
bracing the roof with a rod, repairing the doors and locking them, and also cleaning the previously abused sanctuary. Under their care, the church ministered not only to the spiritual needs of the congregation, but also the secular. It operated a Sunday school, held holiday parties and other community gatherings, and its pastor was actively involved with the Republican Party and encouraged the members to be civically engaged. Tithing was significant enough to provide a salary for this minister who, with the compensation he received from the other churches he served, was able to purchase property and build a home for his family. Moreover, the members organized a missionary society at that time that is still in existence today. Fast forward 12 years. William Fogelsong, the sole surviving white trustee of the original Lewisburg Baptist Church, was worshiping in the neighboring town of Ronsevert, and they wanted to rebuild their church. So even though Fogelsong had not attended the church in Lewisburg in almost 20 years, and there had been 12 years of excellent worship, stewardship, and fellowship by the current congregation, Fogelsong brought suit in circuit court to evict the black congregants, sell the property, and use the proceeds for his new church. He filed his lawsuit with the expectation that because he was white, the court would decide in his favor. He asserted that as a white man, he was the only remaining legal representative of the Lewisburg Baptist Church and alleged that since, quote, said building is entirely useless to those for whom it was erected, it would be in their interest and the interest of the church to have said church and lot sold. To achieve this end, Fogelsong hired the most prestigious lawyer in the county, John A. Preston, a man of formidable character. Papers were filed in circuit court and the suit was announced by tacking notices to the doors of both the courthouse and the church. Naturally, the black congregants defended themselves. They answered the initial petition themselves, and then they too hired a lawyer, a plucky defense attorney named James McPherson. The case lingered for two years until it was decided in 1886. Okay, those are the facts. Now let's talk a little bit about the people involved in the case. We'll start first with the petitioners. John Preston, the attorney for the petitioners, was the son of a Presbyterian minister. He was born in Lewisburg on the large estate that his family named Tuscawilla. The value of this property in 1870 was around $18,000 when the average American house cost 700. Until the end of the Civil War, this property was maintained by many enslaved people. Preston attended school at the prestigious Lewisburg Academy. In 1865, at the age of only 17, he interrupted his studies and followed his two older brothers in service to the Confederate cause. After the war ended, he graduated from Washington College, now called Washington and Lee, and during the time that he was there, Robert E. Lee was actually the president of the college. Then he studied law under Samuel Price, a former slave owner of significant holdings who had served as Lieutenant Governor of the Confederate Government of Virginia. Preston worked in Price's law firm, married Price's daughter, and resided directly across the street until he and his wife purchased the Price family home. And the street on which they lived um, is now named Preston Boulevard. Preston was a redoubtable and upright man. He was an active member of the Democratic Party and devoted to the Presbyterian Church. 
Crespin served first as a deacon and then as ruling elder. His obituary stated that, quote, no one could charge him with unsteadiness or inconsistency, for he squared his walk and conversation, his business and daily life with religion. He professed and followed the master in humility and devotion. Preston was admitted to the bar in 1873. After only three years practicing law, he began serving as the prosecuting attorney of Greenbrier County, holding this elected position for most of his life. And uh, a little sidebar here that uh, we may get a chance to talk about uh, in Q&A, uh, Preston was the prosecuting attorney in the 1897 Greenbrier ghost case, the only known case where a man was actually found guilty of murder based on a ghost's testimony. Now, in order to present a strong, persuasive, and perhaps intimidating case, Preston solicited the testimony of five incredibly influential community leaders. The first two petitioners were Reverend J.P. Caldwell and Reverend Christopher H. Payne, ministers for two missionary Baptist churches in neighboring Monroe County. Like Lewisburg, the Baptist congregation in the town of Union, the capital of Monroe County, split on racial lines after the Civil War, with the white members relocating to the nearby community of Red Sulphur Springs. Accordingly, Campbell pastored to the white adherents and Payne ministered to the black congregants. Reverend James Patrick J.P. Campbell was a distinguished citizen of Monroe County. His father was one of the original pioneer settlers of the area. Like his six brothers and 22 cousins, Campbell served in the Confederate Army, joining at the age of 17. Upon returning home after the war, he joined the Baptist Church and soon was licensed to preach. A few years later, he was appointed to serve as county superintendent of schools. His obituary boldly claimed, quote, probably no man of his generation was better known or more beloved by the people of Monroe and to thousands his death has been a personal affliction. Reverend Christopher Payne was one of the most preeminent men of his day, achieving success not only at the local and state level, but also the national level. Payne's parents were two of the first free blacks whose marriage was officially recognized in the court records of Monroe County. Payne graduated from the Richmond Theological Institute and preached throughout West Virginia and in Virginia, addressing national assemblies of Baptists, both black and white. He founded the first newspaper in West Virginia to be owned and edited by a person of color and went on to establish two other newspapers in the state. He was also the first person of color to be elected to the West Virginia legislature and the second to be admitted to the state bar. Payne also achieved positions of prominence within the Republican Party and was appointed by President Theodore Roosevelt as general consul to the US Virgin Islands. The third petitioner listed in the case was James Withrow, a pillar of society in Lewisburg. His father was one of the early settlers of Lewisburg and a successful tanner. His mother was the daughter of Thomas Edgar, the man who originally surveyed the town. So Edgar was to Lewisburg what William Churton was to Hillsborough. Withrow inherited his parents' grand brick home in downtown Lewisburg with a total property value listed in the 1870 census of approximately $20,000, so higher than Tuscawilla. While his primary occupation was farming, he held many positions of legal authority, even though he was never admitted to the bar. Additionally, he represented the county in the state legislature and was also ordained as a ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church, 
where he served as the choir director. And uh, hopefully it's coming up. You can see then in this 1825, all of the property that he owned in downtown Lewisburg, and it was quite substantial. According to the 1860 census, Withrow held 13 slaves who ranged in age from six months to 60 years, and they all shared two houses. This was a considerable number for Lewisburg. As you can see, um, uh, only 46 households held slaves and the average holding was, was five per household. Withrow was also an ardent supporter of the Confederacy. At the start of the war, he was 43 and considered too old to join. However, as soon as his eldest son, Edgar, attained the age of 17, the boy served in the 14th Virginia Cavalry, the same unit as attorney Preston. In addition, Withrow's devotion to the lost cause was so great that when Robert E. Lee visited Greenbrier County in 1867, he called at the Withrow's home. The tablecloth used for dinner that day was retired from service and has been carefully preserved all these years. Ironically, Withrow's personal motto for which he was known was justice and equal rights to all men and special privilege to none. The fourth petitioner, James Cox, was either 72 or 73 years of age at the time of his deposition. He couldn't remember which one. He had lived in, in uh, Lewisburg for either 64 or 65 years and served as the town's constable for many of those years. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a photo of him um, or a, a grave mark. The fifth petitioner, Mark Spots, was born in Lewisburg and in 1886 had the reputation as the oldest native citizen. He held many civic positions, including deputy clerk of the US District Court. And I found it interesting. Um, I found an 1894 encyclopedia entry extolling spots for having, quote, the clerk's office in perfect order. He was the only man alive who could put his hand on any and every paper in the office. The sixth petitioner was John Cox, son of James Cox. John Cox held the eminent position of postmaster and had served on the board of, of school trustees for over 12 years at the time of this case. The final petitioner in the case, William Fogelsong, had credentials that were less exalted, but still impressive. His father was a respected Mason and built many of the most important stone structures in Lewisburg, including the Presbyterian Church that you see pictured here. Fogelsong lived just outside of Lewisburg in a four room log house. His occupation was listed on censuses as carpenter, and wagon maker. His property was valued at $2,300 and he did not hold slaves. A tradesman, Fogelsong was less educated and civically engaged than his fellow petitioners. He was able to read and write, but his grammar and diction were poor in comparison to the others. His wife, Ellen, was a homemaker who could read but not write she was the one who persuaded him to join the Baptist church. Unlike his attorney and fellow petitioners who were often mentioned in the newspaper in connection with community activities, Fogelsong's name does not appear in surviving newspapers of the late of the 1880s. However, when Fogelsong died in 1897, the local newspaper, the Greenbrier Independent declared, quote, he was a good man, a good citizen, a consistent Christian. He was one of the pillars in the Baptist church and his home always the retreat of Baptist ministers. Okay, let's talk about the respondents now. 
In comparison to these preeminent men on the side of the prosecution, the respondents were from the most marginalized sector of society. This marginalization occurred because the white citizens of Greenbrier County either supported directly or tacitly permitted practices that oppressed people of color. In the antebellum period, both slaves and free blacks were tyrannized and abused through the consistent passage and enforcement of state and local laws. For example, the bylaws of the town of Lewisburg, which had taken effect in 1849, prohibited people of color from congregating in public places, subject to penalty of five to 30 lashes well laid on. But the penalty was harsher on Sundays when, if even two were assembled together on streets, sidewalks, or porches, they would be arrested and appropriate punishment meted out by the justices of the town. Organized patrols monitored the streets to ensure compliance. And who were the justices of the town? Which men were in the patrols? Why the very men I just described to you in the prosecution. The bylaws further prescribed lashes for disturbing the peace or carrying a firearm and forbade the selling or buying of any property by a slave. Moreover, free Blacks were required to register at the courthouse as well as to carry papers to prove they had residency permission. And they were only allowed to remain in the county if they were duly employed. During the Civil War and its aftermath, the people of Greenbrier County remained openly hostile to emancipation and granting rights to the freedmen. The overwhelming majority of citizens remained both pro-slavery and allegiant to Virginia. When the public vote on the secession ordinance was held in May 1861, Greenbrier County voted 1,016 to 110 in favor of secession, and most able-bodied men fought for the Confederacy. They did not support West Virginia seceding from Virginia to become its own state. They wanted to stay with Virginia and um, were only brought in kicking and screaming. After the war, its citizens resisted the Republican efforts to enfranchise the freedmen and provide them with the necessary protections to ensure equal treatment under the law. In 1866, the Greenbrier Independent ran an editorial which proclaimed, gentlemen, you are white men, so are we. You believe that white men and that white men alone should rule this country, so do we. You are not willing that the Negro should sit on juries, hold office, vote, eat at your tables, sleep in your beds, or associate as the equal of yourselves and your families. Neither are we. There's more language like that in the newspaper, um, but I will spare you the disgusting details. It is important to remember that people back then felt no compunction. Um, they, they did not hide their, their racist views. Racism was noxious at the state level as well. Don't have the time tonight to delineate, but one of the main arguments for West Virginia's seceding from Virginia to become a separate state was to be able to control the state borders to prevent free blacks from entering. So we've got this lore that most people think that West Virginia um, seceded because they wanted to be a free state yeah, they wanted to be free from Virginia, but also free from all African Americans. They did not want black people in the state. And they, they wanted to control their borders. Uh, and by 1868, the Ku Klux Klan had organized Clavens throughout the state to terrorize black Americans and ensure that they remain politically and economically disadvantaged. Between 1889 and 1918, 
28 Black Americans were lynched in West Virginia, giving it the highest per capita rate of lynchings in the United States, not Mississippi, not Alabama, West Virginia. Due to this oppressive environment, little is known about the six men and women who represented the congregation of Lewisburg Baptist Church in the 1886 court case, aside from the most basic information. With the exception of one short obituary, they are not mentioned by name in the local newspaper, have no surviving portraits or family descendants who are still in the area, and are not recorded as being buried in any of the local cemeteries, at least not that I could find. On the rare occasion that they are listed in documents, um, such as the census, which they're not always listed in, their names were often spelled in a variety of ways. For example, Jane Pryor, sometimes her name was spelt P-R-I-O-R, sometimes P-Y-R-O-R, and there were actually other uh, spellings than that. And um, something to think about in regard to the dynamics of this case, before 1865, some of the respondents may even have been enslaved by the Prestons, Withrow, and Price families or their friends. The first and longest deposition among the respondents was provided by Reverend A.W. Woodley. He served as the pastor of the Lewisburg Baptist Church for 11 years from 1882 to 1893. In 1886, Woodley was 38 years old, lived in Ronsevert, and ministered to three other churches. During the Civil War, he had served as a private in the Ohio Infantry. Woodley was very well spoken and literate. He was the only respondent to sign his name rather than use a mark. So Woodley's military service and educational level suggest that he had lived in Ohio as a free person and then moved to West Virginia after the war. During his 11 year tenure as pastor, Woodley achieved high status within the local Republican party. Interestingly to me, um, Woodley was not listed in any of the censuses or other legal records that I could find except for the births of his two daughters who were born one year apart both on Valentine's Day. I did find an obituary for him. He died in February 1897 while preaching in Thurmond, West Virginia, and he was brought back to Ronsiver for burial. Unlike Woodley, the other respondents were all born into slavery within a 75 mile radius of Lewisburg. William Baker was the second respondent to provide testimony. In his deposition, he stated that he was approximately 60 years old and resided in Little Sulphur Springs. Baker seems to have been the only respondent who attended Lewisburg Baptist Church before the Civil War. The third to testify, Jane Pryor, was married to Perry Pryor, and interesting that they chose her to testify instead of her husband. She was a direct neighbor on Court Street to Samuel Price, which makes me believe that she might have been one of his slaves. The Pryor's occupations were listed on the census, but they were not listed, sorry, on the census, uh, but the survey recorded that neither she nor her husband could read or write. The remaining three respondents, Mary Harvey, Giles Perry, and Charles Dawson, were all born in Bath County, Virginia, and were married with the husbands working on farms while the wives kept house. While none of the three could write, Perry and Dawson were able to read. Although not listed as a respondent in the case, John W. Jackson served as the clerk of the Lewisburg Baptist Church and was therefore an integral part of their defense writing the original response to the potential eviction order. Jackson never attended school, but learned to read and write and had, as you can see, excellent penmanship. His script was far more legible 
than any of the other white clerks of record in the case who held paid positions. Jackson worked as a laborer and performed odd jobs. His wife, Nanny, was also literate, and two of their 10 children became teachers. They lived on Court Street in a home that he owned outright with no mortgage. The property was valued in 1930 at $5,000. Uh, this was when the average home price for white people was $5,000 whereas the um, Black Americans, most of them had homes valued between 1,000 and 1,500. As far as I could determine, Jackson is the only one of the 31 members of the church in the 1880s who still has descendants in Lewisburg. Unfortunately, the attorney for the respondents has been completely forgotten over time, James C. McPherson. There's no road in Lewisburg named for him. I couldn't even find a photograph of him. Yet McPherson actually had a fairly similar upbringing and career as prosecutor John Preston. However, his unique experiences and personality characteristics led him in a strikingly different direction. McPherson was the seventh of eight children and youngest son to Amanda McClung and Colonel Joel McPherson. The McPhersons were a propertied and respected family and they held slaves. Colonel McPherson had served as clerk of the circuit court of Greenbar County and held like seven other public offices. He was one of the few in Lewisburg who sided with the union during the Civil War, and therefore one of the few who, after the war, could vote and hold office during Reconstruction. I believe there were eight other men in Lewisburg at the time who um, were franchised and, and could vote and hold office. Although James McPherson's older brothers all attended college, no discernible records exist which indicate that James had much, if any, formal schooling. He was 10 years of age when hostilities forced the Lewisburg Academy to close, and public high schools were not established in Greenbar County until the 1870s, at which time McPherson was too old to attend. McPherson's education was most likely gained through independent tutelage at home, as well as hands-on experience. experience. Before becoming an attorney, he worked as deputy clerk of the circuit court and sold insurance to make ends meet. No announcement in the newspaper recorded when he was called to the bar, but he is listed as a notary public beginning in 1873 and was enumerated as a lawyer on the 1880 census. Even though he represented a group of black people against a group of white people, which I assumed would have been harmful to both his person and his career, um, McPherson became more prominent, more preeminent after the case was decided. In 1890, he became a commissioner of the court and eight years later, a justice for the Lewisburg district. Now, despite all these similarities with Preston, James McPherson was younger and had a jovial personality that contrasted directly with the stalwart and steady prosecutor. The Greenbrier Independent asserted, quote, Jim was a bright fellow with a genial, companionable disposition, polite and popular manners, and excellent native capacities of mind. He had a keen sense of the ridiculous and was fond of a joke could see something humor in almost any situation and rarely joined a party of his friends that he did not have something funny to tell. In August, 1880, a tournament was held near the fairgrounds. Preston was asked to deliver an inspirational charge in the morning. McPherson was tasked with delivering a lighthearted coronation address in the afternoon for the crowning of the queen of love and beauty and her maids of honor. And you can just imagine some of the things he might've said. 
McPherson never married and never owned a house. When the census was taken in 1880, he was 29 years old and living with his sister and her family. By 1900, he lived on his own, but he resided in his rented law office. The most significant difference between Preston and McPherson concerned the manner of their deaths. At the age of 70, Preston peacefully fell over on his seat in a train as it coincidentally passed by his boyhood home. In contrast, McPherson's life ended tragically and violently at the age of 50 when he committed suicide, shooting himself in the chest. His final remarks, quote, it will all be over soon, suggest that he had been suffering mental anguish. In addition, McPherson had presumably attempted suicide earlier since the June 1880 announcement in the Greenbrier Independent had noted that he accidentally shot himself in the abdomen while reloading his pistol. Although John Preston is buried prominently in the main cemetery of the town, as are the entire McPherson family, James McPherson lies somewhere unknown. Okay, now it's time for the case. In order to represent their clients' positions, Preston framed his argument in In Re Lewisburg Baptist Church in regard to issues of race, while McPherson relied on colorblind points of law. Preston's sole claim in the matter was that the deed for the property had been conveyed to a white congregation. Therefore, the agent of the white congregation maintained ownership and had the authority to sell the property. His line of reasoning was to establish that the 1855 property deed was conveyed to specific white trustees of the Lewisburg Baptist Church, a church composed of white members governed by the Greenbrier Association, and that the property had been continuously used by white people. With such a narrow focus, he posed few questions and he only cross-examined the first three witnesses for the respondents. Preston's plan was to have Campbell and Payne testify that the Lewisburg Baptist Church belonged to the Greenbrier Association, a governing body with control over church property, which they could dispose of as they pleased. Withrow, James Cox, and Spots were called to testify that the Lewisburg Baptist Church was comprised of white members and that the 1855 deed was conveyed to a white congregation. John Cox was called to testify that white people had never actually abandoned the building and had used it continuously for public school classes. While the star witness, Fogelsong himself, was to testify that no other white trustee was alive or in the area, making him the sole remaining original trustee, that the only Blacks who previously attended the church were slaves and therefore not members of the church, that white people had granted permission to the current congregation to use the church, and that Fogelsong had been checking up on them to be certain they were maintaining it properly, intimating that since they had only been granted permission and nothing else more formal, permission could be revoked. But Preston's case had no real legal merit to it and was based only on racism. First, both of the Baptist pastors concurred that each Baptist church is completely independent and the Greenbrier Association has no authority over them. Interestingly, when Campbell began his deposition, McPherson objected and tried to discredit him as a witness 
until he heard what Campbell was testifying, and then he withdrew his objection. Evidently, Preston knew little about the structure of the Baptist organization and assumed they were like the Presbyterians. Oops. In cross-examination, McPherson was also able to get Withrow, Cox, and Spots to admit that they weren't Baptists and didn't really know much about the Lewisburg Baptist congregation, that, that people of color had indeed attended the Baptist church all along, and that the 18, 80, 1855 deed makes no reference whatsoever to race. Under McPherson's cross-examination, John Cox revealed that the white school only used the basement and only for one year, and that the colored congregation was using the rest of the building, quote, for church purposes. To repeat, he got them to acknowledge that the whites were using it for public school and not church like the black congregation and that the deed specifically stated for church purposes. Finally, McPherson was able to get Fogelsong to admit that the deed applied to any duly recognized trustees as opposed to specific people and that the only reason the black congregants had not originally been considered members was because they were slaves then, which they no longer were. All six witnesses for the petitioners testified that the church was being well-maintained and would have been completely unusable had the current congregation not fixed it up. In contrast, McPherson strove to remove the racial component and define the case through the racially neutral accepted components that legally validate a church. Specifically, he endeavored to establish that the 1855 deed conveyed the property to duly elected trustees of the Baptist Church of Lewisburg, a church of congregants worshiping consistent with the faith and practices of all missionary Baptist churches. The existing church faithfully followed the Baptist traditions and he got them to, to a little uh, zinger there, was open to all to attend. The present congregation had properly maintained the building and therefore the current trustees were the legitimate successors. And as you, you saw, McPherson actively questioned every single person who testified. McPherson relied on his six witnesses to substantiate the claim that the present Lewisburg Baptist Church was the legitimate successor to the church described in the deed. He asked all six to affirm that no other Baptist church existed in Lewisburg and that as the proprietary congregation, they had been properly caring for the building and Reverend Woodley avowed that no differences in faith doctrine, tenets, and mode of worship could be found between the current and the antebellum congregation. As a final buttress to this case, and I, I imagine it coming in at the last moment um, to kind of you know, help save the day, uh, McPherson included a deposition from Sarah T. Harrison, a white member of the original antebellum congregation who claimed to have contributed to the erection of the church building in the 1840s. Harrison swore that she gave her permission to the respondents to use the church for religious purposes and that, quote, she most seriously objects to the attempted sale of said property and devoting the proceeds to a church in Ronsevert that she much prefers that the church be left as it is and for the use of the Baptists, the colored at present. All right, a judge now. Given his personal affiliations and the general prejudices of the day, Judge Homer A. Holt should have been disposed to favor the white petitioners 
and their argument based on race. I, I kind of imagine that maybe the, the reason, you know, Preston didn't put on such a strong case was he thought it was a, you know, slam dunk who, who needed to. Um, Holt was privileged to attend some of the finest schools. He studied for three years at Rector College and continued his academic work at the University of Virginia. At UVA, Holt was enmeshed in a culture that embraced slavery and its heinous racial attitudes. Slaves were routinely subjected to verbal as well as physical abuse and, quote, records of the university indicate that students were more likely to be disciplined for wearing the wrong jacket than for assaulting a slave. As a young man, Holt owned slaves and his close associations were with slave owners. Although he freed his slaves, Holt fought for the Confederacy, spent nearly two years as a federal prisoner before he was exchanged, and was reported to be a supporter of the lost cause. When the Civil War concluded, Holt was one of many former Confederates who were disfranchised until 1872. Then, after the new West Virginia Constitution was adopted and Holt was able once again to hold public office, he was elected circuit court judge for the Seventh Circuit, moved to Lewisburg, and began serving in 1873. Holt was also engaged in economic activities that allied him monetarily with the petitioners. In 1871, Holt assisted in founding the Bank of Lewisburg. This financial venture most likely put him in favorable contact with the petitioners who were property owners and or businessmen and likely to be customers of his, yet it most likely did not connect him with any of the respondents. Holt was actively involved in real estate, purchasing and selling numerous tracts of land throughout the state. Only four months before deciding in Ray Lewisburg Baptist Church, he purchased 139 acres from John Preston. In addition to these motivating factors, Holt had two other strong incentives to put aside the entreaty of the black respondents who were attempting to protect their newly earned rights and instead to curry favor from the white citizens who sought to assert their historical dominance. Holt's position as circuit court judge was subject to both re-election and impeachment. Because the term of a circuit court judge was eight years and in an especially unpopular decision could have affected Holt's chances of holding his seat. And he faced re-election in 1888. A June 1885 column in the Greenbrier Independent reported that on three occasions, the Charleston newspaper, the Daily Times, had taken, quote, Judge Holt severely to task in the administration of the law and discharge of his duty. While the editor of the Independent defended Holt at that time, the paper could easily have turned on him and swayed public opinion. Furthermore, circuit court jurisdictions were subject to redistricting. Although Holt had won re-election in 1880, a redistricting as was done in 1872 and again in 1887, the year following the verdict of this case, might have gerrymandered Holt into a district with fewer supporters among the electorate. electorate. Additionally, the threat of impeachment loomed large. In 1870, the West Virginia State Legislature impeached Judge Nathaniel Harrison, Holt's predecessor in the Seventh Judicial Circuit. Harrison, who was from Monroe County and a relative of all these famous other Harrisons, had been appointed to the position in 1865 by Governor Arthur Borman. 
Samuel Price had actually won the election for the position, but Borman, who was a Republican, said that he would not allow a traitor to hold this position. As, as I mentioned before, Samuel Price was, was the Lieutenant Governor of the Confederate Government of Virginia. The decision to impeach Harrison was completely political. The main charges against him were his, quote, relentless enforcement of laws disfranchising former Confederates and hindering their pardon applications. Democrats all voted in favor of impeachment and removal, Republicans against. However, Judge Holt accepted neither the racist arguments put forth by the petitioners nor any public pressure to do so. His reasons for deciding in favor of the respondents are unrecorded, but presumably lie with the strength of McPherson's argument, which revealed the legitimacy and vitality of the Black congregation. Court documents for the case merely state that the petition was denied and the case dismissed. So I know, very anticlimactic. After all of this stuff that I've talked about, everything that we've gone through, all we get is petition denied, case dismissed. And that's all that we know. We know nothing more why Holt decided the way that he did, which was so uncharacteristic uh, of him and the times. Interestingly, Holt originally decreed that the respondents should recover their costs, their court their, uh, that, that they ex expended in the case, their, their court uh, costs. But this dictate was crossed out of the document. So um, my guess is that that never happened. Surprisingly, Holt's decision was accepted by the citizens of Greenbrier County and throughout the state. No discernible outcry was recorded in any of the local or state newspapers, and I even looked in, in Virginia newspapers, couldn't find a thing. Consequently, In Ray Lewisburg Baptist Church stands as an example of the historically inconsistent and disjointed attitudes of the white citizens of Greenberg County and throughout the state of West Virginia toward people of color. Overt racism has tended to wax and wane according to individual opinions, actions, and the times. Of course, covert forms of interpersonal, institutional, and structural racism remain. That's that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Courtney, this was, as somebody put in this, into the chat box, incredibly well researched there. Uh, people are really enjoying this. And actually, people would like to know, are you sharing this with any larger institutions? Somebody uh, suggested the Smithsonian, perhaps there's some other I know there's the, you know, the Southern history Americans, you know, are, are you uh, sharing this research? Because it looks like this is something that has gone unnoticed in history, but was, um, you know, pivotal for that community. Um, I hadn't thought about it, so thank you for the vote of confidence, and, and maybe I shall. And uh, if you have any questions, if you'd like to stick around for a few minutes, feel free to pop them in the chat box. Um, you know, I was wondering, you said that newspaper really could have made or, or, or broken this and, and decided public outcry. You were saying that um, what they, they printed could really influence the, the population there. And I was wondering what their relationship to the judge then may have been. Were they afraid of repercussions from the judge or were they really reading the room and saying, wow, this is like 50-50 in this city? I have absolutely no idea and I'm not really sure that there's any way to know. So I did a lot of, of reading. Um, it would be interesting, you know, for somebody who wanted to, to carry the, the torch to look at other decisions um, by Holt and see whether this was consistent behavior or whether this was completely out of line with all of his other decisions. Um, when I started my research, uh, and I couldn't find anything about James McPherson, I just figured he had gotten run out of town. 
<laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I was very, very surprised, you know, based on, on the, the verbiage, you know, what I was, was reading to you from the Greenbrier Independent. Um, and uh, as I said, you know, a, a lot of it, you know, goes to, to James McPherson, a lot of it goes to the um, courage, bravery, integrity of the, the members of the church. And, um, I, I, you know, all of the, the people involved in the case were religious. So I wonder if, you know, maybe they had some, you know, second thoughts about evicting a, a, con a thriving congregation who was taking good care of a church from um, their, their building. And speaking of this congregation, are they still thriving? Is this still an active church? Yes, 100%. Um, very, very active. And I was very privileged to uh, attend some services with them. Um, just a, a, a very warm, loving group. And, and as I mentioned, they still have, um, they take the missionary side of it very seriously and um, are, are still engaged in a lot of missionary work um, throughout the world. So, mm -hmm. um, Yes, yeah, great group of people. And so uh, post-Civil War then, um, when this congregation took over, was there immediately a black reverend appointed? Somebody wanted to know, um, you know, it, what, was, what was that switch over and when did it happen and how fully did it happen? So great question. Um, originally, actually, um, there were uh, white ministers and it was a while before um, the black ministers um, were hired and, and brought to it. Um, the congregation actually uh, published a, a book and, and um, I have somewhere um, in my notes the, the names and I don't um, have it with me right now um, for when that um, change um, occurred, um, but it, it wasn't too long afterwards. Excellent. Well, thank you again. If there's anybody else that has any uh, last minute questions, again, feel free to pop those into the uh, chat box for us. But otherwise, Nobody wants I to know about the Greenberg ghost. <laughs> oh, yeah. If there's anybody that wants to stick around, give us a quick rundown of a, the Greenbrier ghost. Right. There was a, a man named Trout Shoe, and there was actually a book written on him, um, the man who wanted uh, six wives. His, his first wife had it, or maybe his first and second wife had um, accidents, and they died as well. And um, his wife, Zona, uh, fell down the stairs and, and died, and um, they very quickly buried her, and um, when... Uh, that they came to, to view for the viewing. She had a big, you know, high neck on, um, you know, high collared and scarf on, on top of it. And um, shortly after she was buried, her ghost came to visit her mother and told her mother, I didn't fall down the stairs, uh, that her husband had strangled her. So they actually, based on the, the ghost's word, they actually exhumed the body removed the scarf and saw um, markings on her neck uh, consistent with strangulation. And the case went to trial and uh, Trout Shoe was convicted and spent the rest of his life in jail um, based on a ghost's testimony and then the other forensic work that they, they have. Um, so very fascinating case. We, we believe it's the only case like that in, in US history. So was it then found after that that he did, in fact, um, also harm his previous wives? They never found anything out about I, I, the other women, but it's, it's speculated that that's what that they met their end uh, that way as well, because he had bragged to somebody at one point that he wanted six wives. Um, all of his descendants, I should say, right, all of his descendants um, maintain that he was 100% innocent. And in Greenberg County, they have um, done several plays. One um, was called Zona, and then the other was called the Greenbrier Ghost. And um, the descendants usually come to one uh, performance and shout things, that's not true, you lies. <laughs> there are two sides. Well, excellent. Thank you for that quick rundown. Uh, by the way, if you want to get in touch with Courtney 
or myself here at the museum to learn more about uh, Courtney's speech tonight, more about the Greenbrier ghost, or more about her book, Lies Based on True Stories, uh, you can contact us at the museum. You can give us a call at 919-732-2201. I believe I popped that in the chat box as well. And always check our Facebook, our Instagram, and our website, www.orangehistorync.org for more information. So thank you again for joining us here tonight. If you'd like to engage again with more of Courtney's work, um, her novel is here available uh, at the uh, museum store for purchase. You can also buy it through Amazon. We really appreciate your engagement in these programs. Uh, we're so glad to be able to offer these quality content programs for free to the community. Um, and if you enjoyed tonight, we would really appreciate your support through any donations that you can offer us. Um, and you can donate through our website. We also hope that you can make time to visit our brand new exhibit. It's just open called What's Your Flavor? It examines heritage cooking, features local chefs, and artworks that were specifically created for this exhibit. Uh, based on inspirations that the artist had with some of our collection items. So they are, are completely unique um, and have never been displayed anywhere except for right here, right now. We are currently open Fridays through Sundays, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And as always, we are free to visit. So again, frequently check our uh, social media and our website for any upcoming offerings. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and uh, we hope you have a wonderful evening. <laughs>